Hello students, I am Shreya. I teach English at English Literature at Global Teachers Academy. And today I have compiled for you some very important questions that would be very fundamental for you to tackle the UGC net exam, the upcoming UGC net exam, which is about a month later, right? And these are the important questions that we've taken up from all important sections of the syllabus, including British literature, world literature, uh, literary criticism and theory, English language teaching, as well as rhetorics, right? So let us begin by looking at the first question. The first question says by the end of In Memoriam, the speaker A re-embraces a Christian vision of afterlife, B reasserts religious doubts and scientific skepticism, C reiterates the Darwinian view of social life, D reforms his faith in universal brotherhood. Right? A little bit about the poem. Po the, this poem is very important. It's written by Alfred. Lord Tennyson. The poem was written in 1849 and is a very important poem in the poet's life because it was written after the sudden death of his very close Cambridge friend whose name was Arthur Henry Hallam. Right? Now this question about his friend has featured in various net exams so it becomes a very important fact for you here. Now this poem, he's so he's sort of mourning the loss of a dear friend, a friend that he's lost to a sudden death. And so if you just look at the options and even if you're not aware about what the poem is and if you've not read the poem, but you just keep the theme in mind, you can almost understand that the answer could be A. Why? Why would the answer be A? The answer could be A because it's talking about a Christian vision of afterlife. Now this person, the poet, has suddenly lost his friend. He's writing a poem about his, he's mourning the loss. And where is the space for then the poet to come again in terms with the poet, in terms with his friend again, to come in terms with the friend again, to reach back to the friend, to have the relationship again, is through the Christian vision of afterlife. So after this life is perhaps the time in which is, is per, so after this world, after this living world is the time perhaps in which Lord Alfred Tennyson could get again with his friend Henry Hallam, right? Moving on now to the next question, which of the following psychoanalysts rewrote Descartes' dictum? I think therefore I am as I am not where I think and I think where I am not, right? So very important, now all these psychoanalysts Lacan, Freud, Jung, Sisu. All these you must have a brief understanding as to the kind of theories that they are given about in literary criticism and theory. Right? Lacan, I have included a question also further because Lacan becomes a very important psychoanalyst and he's given three orders. So I've included a question further where we're going to discuss this. Whereas, uh, so in this case, it's Lacan who's given this, who's rewrote this dictum. Right? So Lacan has three orders in which he writes, which I, like I told you, we are going to discuss further. But the gist of these orders is that human beings as an I, right, can never completely understand themselves, right? And that understanding can never be projected in the physical self, okay? So he says, I am not where I think and I think where I am not. Right? So there is a lot of unstability in your understanding of the I. What are the things that you think that you are? Right? And how are these things presented in these in the external appearance? Right? A very ex important example and like a trivia for you to remember. He talks about how does the fashion industry today work? The fashion industry today works because you know for a fact that you can't represent everything that you stand for. Right? You can't, so if you think that you're very extrovert, you can't immediately tell people that you're an extrovert. When they see you, they can't see that you're an extrovert. So how do you do that? You dress in a certain fashion that highlights some of your attributes, right? And this is the idea that Lacan talks of, which we'll also discuss further in detail. He's a very important psychoanalyst and you must know the important aspects that he talks of, right? So Jacques Lacan, is your answer. Carl Jung is very important. You must do his idea of unconscious and collective unconscious in order to understand the myth criticism well. Sigmund Freud again was in the Delhi University BA syllabus. So id, ego, super ego, Oedipus complex, Electra complex, all these are very important. Helen Sisu, a text that she wrote, The Laugh of Medusa, again very important text. There was a direct question in 
the last year net exam that asked you to sort of uh, mark the name of the author with the text the uh, uh, helen zizu's text was there in the list right so very important text very important authors here very important psychoanalysts here that you must look at in detail right now the next question is the third question it's it starts with a quote the quote says i will put myself in poor and mean attire and with a kind of auburn smirch my face and with a kind of umber smirch my face right these lines of, are from which shakespearean play your options here are a macbeth b othello c tempest d as you like now i know it's a lot of times it's very difficult for students to answer questions like these because then it's a random code that the net exam picks up from somewhere and then it gets a little difficult for you to understand where it is from right but now here if you know and you must know the summaries of basic shakespeare and plays so you know the summary of macbeth right you should know the summary of you should know the summary of othello and tempest and as you like it all these are very important classic plays that shakespeare has written most of us have already done these in our from our 12th standard to say masters right so most of us have an awareness about the summaries of these now for as you like it you know that there was a disguise right there was the two female characters rosalind and celia when they decide to flee to forest of arden they decide to take up a disguise right and it is when celia is scared of their uh, celia is very apprehensive of their safety because they are in a random forest and they've been grown up in a palace and they've been protected and well protected so when they reach the forest celia is very apprehensive as to what is going to happen to their safety and security and this is when rosalind says that you don't worry i will put myself in poor and mean attire and with a kind of umber smirch my face so umber here is like kind of a dirty ground so kind of like mud i'll smirch my face so that i look like people who belong to the forest and then you along with me both of us will be safe right so the answer here is as you like it right moving on fourth question at the end of the portrait of a lady isabel arker a goes back to the house from the garden b accepts the proposal of casper goodwood 3 straight away refuses the offer of goodwood 4 probably goes back to rome and osmo which is the correct combinations according to the codes so the codes here are a 1 and 2 are correct so goes from house of garden accepts the proposal of casper b 3 and 4 refuses the offer of goodwood and goes back to rome and osmo C one and four, so goes back to the house and goes back to Rome and Osmond. D one and three goes back to the house from garden and refuses the offer of Goodwood. Right now, this text again, the very important text, the portrait of a lady by Henry James. Henry James written in eighteen eighty one. right it's about the journey of this woman called isabel arc right what does she do here she's born she's a new yorker she tends to she's very independent because she was raised by her, her mother died very early so she was raised by her father she's very imaginative very wants to be very independent and has a lot of suitors right the first one that we meet in the novel is casper goodwood and he's been trying to woo her from the beginning of the novel to the end that you'll find right then there is a trip that her aunt offers her and the aunt offers her to take her to europe and she agrees and she leaves casper hanging she says i'm going to tell you if i want to get married to you in a year right there when she's in europe she also meets a certain individual called word burton and he's very he's a very a powerful individual and but his proposal also she rejects when he proposes her to marry her uh she rejects the proposal because she feels that her independence would be at stake if she marries somebody who's as powerful right then she goes on to meet a certain individual while she's on some of more some of her travels she meets an individual called gilbert osman and she ends up marrying this individual now this individual does not have a social standing at all but he is he is supposed to be the finest of all european men and she falls for him and she marries him but the marriage she very soon realizes is a loveless marriage okay and in the end eventually uh casper goodwood comes back again casper goodwood proposes her again but she is she's not able to completely divorce 
herself from the husband even though she knows that it's a loveless marriage she can't completely leave osman and so she probably a for sure goes back to rome and osman and goes back to the house from the garden right so your options are 1 and 4 and again this text is important for you to know that summary of the text is important a detailed summary of the text is important and so this question was included next question high above the north pole on the first day of 1969 two professors of english literature approached each other at a combined velocity of combined velocity of 1200 miles per hour this is the opening line of david lodges a nice work b changing places c small world d the british museum is falling down right important author here important author to look at some of his important works to look at is david lodge right now david lodge is attributed in sort of enhancing the use of what novels campus novels now what are these campus novels campus novels are kind of novels where the main area in where the action the main the setup the setting of the novels is the academic circuit the academic area the university right so campus novel is a novel where the context or where the uh, setting the place where the uh, most action of the novel takes place is a university so david lodge is attributed in enhancing the kind of campus novels that came in right Now, David Lodge has written a trilogy, a trilogy of campus novels. The first one of these is, the first one of these is, Changing Places, which was written in nineteen seventy five, right? The second one is The Small World, which was written in nineteen eighty four, and the third one is Nice Work, which was written in nineteen eighty eight. right for changing places it's also important for you to know the subtitle that it had so the subtitle of changing places is a tale of two campuses from a tale of two cities by charles dickens right another question that was there in one of the net exams is in charles dickens tale of two cities what are the two cities so the two cities are paris and london right so third the third work is nice work and small work small world also has a uh, subtitle it's called an academic romance so through the subtitles you already know how the setting of the novels is usually the university right so this this line this line is the opening line of changing places which was the first work in this trilogy so the next question What did Henry James describe as loose baggy monsters? A novels, B the Spaniards, C epic poems, D his trousers, right? So one option that you can conveniently deny is his trousers. He wouldn't call his trousers as loose baggy monsters, right? But he does call 19th century novels as loose baggy monsters, right? Now why did he describe them as loose baggy monsters? Because he was uh, uh, referring A to the length and yet a strange fascination that some of these russian novels large russian novels like dostoevsky's crime and punishment like leo tolstoy leo tolstoy's anna karenina right all these novels that were very lengthy a large amount of descriptions the plots were various and yet they had a fascinating factor right and there was so much to analyze in them and in reference to those he calls them as loose baggy in words upon words sasior says the actual birth of a new language is never reported in the world because we have never known of a language which was not spoken the day before or which was not spoken in the same way the day before what does he mean a old language the making uh, old languages that make way for new ones right that make way that make way for new ones b the birth and death of a language are not subject to human laws c languages do not get born they evolve out of a previously existing linguistic situation d old speech patterns trigger the birth of a new language right these are your four options now a little bit about sasior very important linguist swiss linguist he was also a, he he was the one who gave us the semiotic theory right where he divided the sign which is essentially the word into signifier and signified right now what are what is the 
signifier signifier is the sound image so when you think of a word dog the d o g is the signifier right and what is the signified signified is the graphic image that comes to your mind whenever i see the word d o g right so there are various aspects of sign of signifier and signified various relationships of signifier and signified that these try to give us right now what are these relationships a little bit about those because it's a very important theory a lot of questions come from here right a he said signs and the relationship between signifier and signified is not universal right just because some people decided that a dog would represent a dog that is the reason why dog is representing a dog right there was no other reason why tree -E could not represent a dog right so it's not universal and it's not like there was some divine intervention that said a dog would mean a dog right now the relationship in the similar fashion the relationship between a signifier and a signified is abstract again the same idea that just because dog tends to represent a dog it does not mean that tree -E in some other language could not represent a dog right and the third point signifier and signified can never be separated right they are like a mirror image representing each other later you know derrida who came up with the deconstructionist theory would defy all these he would take them as pointers and would deconstruct sarsier's idea but for here for now this is important right so now the question says that what does he mean when he says the actual birth of a new language is never has never been reported right because there can never be a there can never be a language that is introduced in a day right language takes time to develop and that's what he's talking about so there can never be a time when this language was never spoken and then the next day suddenly there emerges a language and and people start speaking it right so even if you don't know words upon words that is a text important text that sarsio has written you would still even through the statement understand that language do not get born they evolve out of pre previously existing linguistic situations right so this question here is important but more important are the things that i told you here about sarsio about his theory of signs about his theory of signifier signified and what is the relationship between the signifier and signified that he discusses next question now the modern prometheus is an alternative title of a dracula b frankenstein c caleb williams d the italian right all important texts almost very important for you to remember in terms of their summaries also right the modern prometheus now who is this prometheus prometheus is a myth figure who stole fire from god to give it to humanity right so a very important role that this individual plays while this individual is standing against the status quo right you understand how this individual is standing against the status quo because it's stealing this individual is stealing fire from god right so it stands against the order of par but for humanity so again the kind that uh, the the kind of sacrifices that renaissance men did where they stood against the status quo for the larger good of humanity right now the first so the, this is a myth figure and uh, the question says uh, uh, which of these uh, the modern prometheus is the alternate title for right so your answer here is frankenstein frankenstein written by mary shelley in 1818 right mary shelley married to pb shelley daughter of william godwin and mary wollstonecraft again important here william godwin's text caleb williams right caleb williams has a subtitle which is things as they are again net question okay dracula text by 
Bram Stoker. The first time the figure of the Dracula, as you now understand it, was introduced. Frankenstein again, a text by Mary Shelley. The preface was also, there was a preface that was first written by P.B. Shelley. Then there is the Caleb Williams, Caleb Williams subtitle, Things as They Are, Father of Mary Shelley, William Godwin, written by Father of Mary Shelley, William Godwin. The mother, his wife, was Mary Wollstonecraft. Mary Wollstonecraft, very important text of vindication for the rights of women. Right? The Italian is again a gothic, gothic novel by Anne Radcliffe. So Anne Radcliffe was also writing a lot of gothic novels. This is also gothic. This is also gothic. Frankenstein is, is in a space of sublime. So it's it's also romantic as well as gothic. Right? So your answer here, the alternate title of Frankenstein was Modern Prometheus. Next question here. The Divine Comedy is divided into three cantices. Canticas. Uh, each consisting of A. 30 cantos, B. 33 cantos, C. 24 cantos, D. 28 cantos. Net question again, right? So, Divine Comedy, one of the greatest works of world literature written by Dante in Italian, right? Now, this text is, is divided into three parts. The three parts are Inferno. Which is which is hell, purgatorio, which is purgatory, and the last one is paradiso, which is paradise. And each of these parts has thirty three cantos each, right? It's composed. It's believed to be composed. It's a large text. It's believed to be composed of fourteen thousand two hundred and thirty-three lines. Right. So your answer here becomes B, which is thirty-three. Moving on from here, your twelfth, your tenth question, halfway through, in relation to Spencer's Fairy Queen, which of the following character virtue link is rightly matched? Important question again. A lot of times this question is featured in the exam. Who is the Spencer? It's Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. Right? Important text again. When was this written? It was published in around 1590. Right? And it's a long text. It's a long text. It was believed, it, 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 it stopped after six books, but it was believed to be a larger, greater text. Right? Now, in this text, one book represents one virtue, and this virtue in the text is represented through one character. Right? Now, this uh, question asks you about three. Right, but we are going to obviously discuss all five. So your book one is uh, is the book is the first book where the character uh, the the virtue is holiness, right? And it's represented through it's represented through a character called Red Cross, right? In the same book, there is also a character that represents religion which is Lady Una. Okay, so your book one is covered. I am writing it separately so that you guys can take notes and make a note out of this because it's an important question, right? So book one, holiness represented through Red Cross and religion in the same uh, book is represented by Lady Una, right? So your next book is where temperance is the virtue. Temperance, right? So your next book is where temperance is the virtue. And which is the character that represents temperance? Gion. Right? So, like you can see here, you can already start matching. So, where is temperance? Your C and D options could be the correct on answer because you know A and B is not right. Right? So, this is your book 2. Right? Now, moving on to book 3. Right? Book 3, where the virtue that is represented is chastity. Okay. And the character that represents it is Britomart. Okay. So, book 3, the characteristic, the virtue that is represented is chastity. And the character that represents it is Britomart. Moving on. There is book 4 that represents the virtue of Friendship. And so, obviously, there are going to be two characters that represent friendship. There is Campbell and there is Triamond. Okay.
okay so the combination of these two characteristics represent uh, the, the combination of these two characters their friendship together represents the virtue of friendship so any time there are two characters you can know, easily understand that the virtue would be friendship so now this this uh, the, these these things can come as anything which virtue is represented in which book which book represents which virtue what are the characteristic uh, characters that represent friendship friendship is represented through which set of characters right so be prepared for all possible questions from this part then there is book 5 the virtue is justice and it's represented through article right here again your option says article right you see this here your c option where justice is represented through article right now your last book the sixth book where the virtue is courtesy and the character that represents courtesy is calidor right so you got all six books all six virtues and all six characters that represent each so your correct answer here it's a learning thing so once you learn it it's very easy for you to understand and the correct answer here is c moving on to the next question the following writers are involved in social activism in addition to their practice of creative writing the first the first code is mahashweta devi b shashi desh pande c arundhati roy 4 shobha de the correct combination according to the code is a 1 and 2 are correct b 3 and 4 are correct c 1 and 3 are correct d 2 and 4 are correct right now arundhati roy if you know anything about her she's written two books so far first is the god of small things and the second one that came out very recently is the ministry of utmost happiness in the period of two books there was almost a 10 year gap in between the two books and in this period of 10 years she was right, she was she was involved in a lot of political activism right she was talking about the ills of globalization she was involved in a lot of anti globalization movement she was talking about neo imperialism she was talking about the ills of capitalism so arundhati roy for sure is your answer right now b and c options like i told you in the last slide also again once you know one of one, once you know one option is correct you automatically get 50% you, you, you reduce 50% chances of getting the wrong answer so now there is a 50 50% chance of you to get the right answer or losing it right now b is uh, b says 3 and 4 now fourth option is shobha day shobha day is a socialite so to say right so uh, if you know anything if you read about the newspapers a little bit you would know that she's not perhaps that involved in political activism mahashweta devi however was extremely involved when uh, she was she criticized the government when large uh, tracts of land fertile land were taken away from farmers right and they were used by government and industrial houses were built upon them right so she was a fundamental figure when she was criticizing these people and she was also in her formative years was very actively involved in the freedom struggle right so mahashweta devi is the correct answer one and three become your answer so the correct code is c right the question here is lexis refers to a all words form a, forms having meaning or grammatical functions b history of the words c set of select word forms d the selection of words so lexis stands for lexicon it's a set of all the words right all words having meaning right so your option is a it's not a very difficult question it's it's a very known linguistic word lexicon right you even call your dictionary sometimes as the lexicon it's a very usual word that all of us tend to use so the correct option is a all word forms having meaning or grammatical functions right even if you look at the other words it, how can it be the history of words there are so many words and each word has different history how can it be a combination of all all histories of all words right it's a difficult it's a difficult thing to uh, sort of bring together and comprehensively have then it's not a select uh, study of selected words it's also not a selection of some words right so lexicon refers to all words that have meaning or grammatical function next question your next question here is match the following lists list 1 which is the title of some poems and list 2 which is the poet right so the first one is a hero of flybuzz second is birches third is sunday morning 
Fort is a supermarket in California. Your poets are Wallace Stevens, Emily Dickinson, Allen Ginsberg and Robert Frost. If you know anything about Robert Frost, you know that nature is an nature is an important symbol, right? So if there is anything that I could figure out from this list is that Bir- Birches is written by Robert Frost. And if you look at if you find your if you Google search, you'll know you'll also know that Birches was written by Robert Frost, right? So your first is done. So fourth is definitely the second one. Like I said again, so you've reduced the chances of getting you've reduced the 25, 50% chance of getting the wrong answer, right? Now, a little bit I want to, uh, I can give you the right answer right away, but I, I want to talk about this individual a little bit, who is Allen Ginsberg. Now, Allen Ginsberg was a very important beat poet. I included this question here because I wanted to talk a little bit about beat poet and the beat movement. What is the beat movement? And he's given a very important and like a small statement that sums up the uh, emotion or the sentiment of beat writers, which is first thought, best thought. Okay, first thought is the best thought. This is the principle according to which beat poets work, right? So they do not follow any fixed format. They tend to go against the status quo again. Very important texts here are Allen Ginsberg poem, which is not mentioned here. It's a poem called Howl, right? And in the same collection of poems, which is which which he was which he released in 1956, which is called Howl and other poems, there was this poem that was published, which is a supermarket in California. So your fourth is three, right? So you've got your correct answer. Your correct answer is C. One is two. Emily Dickinson is written. I hear a fly buzz, and Wallace Stevens has written Sunday morning, right? So you get your answer here. Little bit more about the beat generation. Uh, two important texts here is uh, these are novels Jack Kerouac's On the Road and As Borrow's Naked Lunch. Right? Remember these things? Your answer here is C. Moving on then to the next question. Given below are two statements, one labeled as assertion, the other labeled as reason. The assertion is deconstructive reading is apolitical. Reason is because it focuses exclusively on language. It primarily holds that all texts or linguistic structures contain within them a a principle of destabilization and hence it is difficult to pin down meaning. Such a reading therefore is unable to assign historic, historical agency, right? Now what is deconstruction? Very important figure for deconstruction is a certain Mr. Derrida, right? It was French. He talked extensively, he started from his, uh, he started his analysis from Saussure's theory of sign and then decided to break it down. He decided to break it down and decided to break down language and say there are, there is no final meaning, no final meaning, only interpretations, right? So there is, he says, no final meaning. Now, your first point says deconstructive reading is apolitical, right? Now, to call something apolitical, you, you're divorcing it from politics. Whereas deconstruction is more about breaking down the political system. So, something that breaks down the political system cannot be called apolitical. The reason it says it because it focuses exclusively on language, right? Had it been, it focuses on language. And it primary, primarily holds that all texts and linguistic structures uh, contain within them a principle of destabilization. The idea of destabilization is very important. So I agree to everything that the reason says except this word exclusively, right? It's not exclusively focusing on language. It is focusing on, on st- all structures. It is focusing on the structure of culture. It is focusing on the structure of government. And it what it is doing in that process, it's breaking down that structure it's breaking, it's destabilizing the structure. It's bringing the center and periphery together. It is saying that there is no center and there is no periphery, right? It is saying that the periphery stands there and the periphery is the one that allows the center to retain its position, right? And for all structures that exist in the society, so not just the structure of language, right? So it does not focus exclusively on language. And then because it's breaking down the political, you can't say that deconstructive reading is apolitical, right? So both A and B, which is the fourth option, which I'm sure is a little less visible to you here, is both A and R are wrong. And I've also explained to you why these are wrong, right? 
the next question here is Jacques Lacan posits three orders which structure human existing existence. In this list that follows, identify the one that is not included by Lacan. Right? Like, like I told you in the second question itself, I've included a question about Lacan's order. Right? So these are the three orders. He talks of three orders, right? The real order, the imaginary order, and the symbolic order. Now for you to understand you, for, for you to understand the real order, we must start with imaginary order. Now, imaginary order is the order where the child very closely associates himself or herself to the mother. There is no awareness in the child that the child is separate from the mother, right? There is no awareness of child separation from the mother and the child feels that the child is with the mother, right? This imaginary stage ends at a certain time which is called the mirror stage right now the child if you know if you look if you know i'm sure you know through your experience if you see a child the child for the longest time looks at the mirror and doesn't realize that the the individual at the mirror is himself or herself but it is one point in child psyche that the child tends to understand that the thing in the mirror is himself or herself and this is called the mirror stage this mirror stage is the stage where the child for the first time gets the awareness that the child is separate from the mother, right? The idea that the child was with the mother breaks, right? And so the child understands that the child has to establish its own identity, has to be a, its own individual to exist in this world. And in this realization is the transit from imaginary to symbolic, right? What is the symbolic order? Symbolic order is the order of the father. So where imaginary is the order of the mother, Symbolic is the order of the father. And what is the order of, or, uh, order of the father about? So the order of the father is about language, is about culture, is about reason, is about law, is about government, right? So the child, once he realizes, he or she realizes that the child is not closely associated to the mother, there is a there is an essential separation. The understanding also results in moving of the child from the mother's order to the father's order because the father's order is powerful. Right? Because it's the order of language, of government, of culture, of reason, of law and all those things that sort of determine your existence in the society. Right? Now this, this imaginary, this journey from imaginary to symbolic happens through the mirror stage. Okay? But this journey is th th this journey is sort of unidirectional so there is only the journey from imaginary to symbolic and never the symbolic to imaginary journey this is what Lacan says right so what is the real order then the real order is a space beyond the imaginary and beyond the symbolic a space where there is no imaginary and no symbolic but Lacan himself says that there is perhaps no uh, there is no time on uh, there is no time on earth where you cannot where real could exist. So, according to Lacan himself, the real doesn't exist. A space where both imaginary and symbolic can be given up, can be transcended, is no space, right? So, the real order does not exist. There is only the imaginary and the symbolic order that exists, right? The mirror stage, like I was telling you in the previous question, gives you the awareness of the I, right? The I becomes fundamental. The I becomes important. Your understanding of the I becomes important and it is through your understanding of I that you try and create an image, external image of self, right? Lacan, if you read Lacan a little bit, you'll also know that Lacan is very, it's extremely against love. He says, how can you, how can I expect somebody to love me when I can't understand myself and I can't understand anybody else? So he says, uh, you will always misunderstand and by virtue, you will always be misunderstood, right? This also relates to the first question that was there, the second question where the second question that was there which was which was talking about i think therefore I, I i am not where i think and i think where i'm not so it's very closely related to the same idea where he says uh, where he says the same thing that uh, you don't know you don't know yourself and so you never know the other person right so the answer again here is the unconscious and these are the three orders that Lacan talks of.
Next question here. Who among the following figures give a preview of Aschenbach's fatal end in Death in Venice? Death in Venice, text by Thomas Mann, German author. When you do world literature, he is an important author that you must look at. It's a 1912 text. Right? So, in the text, the quotes, I'll read out the quotes to you first. The first is the graveyard stranger, the second is the governess, the third is the barber, barber and fourth is the gondolier. Right? Now, this, uh, this text itself is uh, about this individual called Asimba. Right? Now, his death in the text has been preempted. Right? His death, his fatal end has been pre preempted constantly in the text. So, the question asks you pre precisely that. Who are the people who are preempting this character's death? Right? There is a lot of political allegory in the text. There are a lot of things about the uh, that talk about the political problems in the text. And through that process, there is also the preempting of Aschenbach's death. So, I would, I would not go in detail of uh, the summary here. You must read the summary yourself. But the two people who uh, sort of preempt his death are Graveyard Stranger and the Gondolier, right? So, your options here are 1 and 4. So, 1 and 4 is correct. You must look at the summary in detail. I'm leaving that on you people, okay? The next question, which of the following best describes the basic principle of new criticism, right? Now, I've seen a lot of students who are very uh, uncomfortable with theory. I know a lot of students that I teach who are very uncomfortable with theory and tend to leave the theory questions out. But you need to understand the kind of questions that come from theory are very basic. They are extremely basic questions because perhaps the net exam also realizes that people are not that comfortable with theory. Right? So this question about new criticism is sort of, the question is sort of like the question that came in the net examination. Right? It just said principle of, uh, uh, principle of practical criticism. So, one fact that I have given you here is that new criticism is also called practical criticism. Practical criticism is a book by I.A. Richards, right? And so, he is an important person that is associated with new criticism. For any theory that you begin with, for any theory that you start reading, the first question that you must know is who are the people who are associated with this theory, right? So, who are the people who are, who are associated with new criticism? There is I.A. Richards. There is Cleanth Brooks. There is John Croy Ransom. There is your very own T.S. Eliot, who called a part of this criticism as Lemon Squeezer School of Criticism. Right? There is Wimsett and Beardsley. Right? So, these are the important fundamental figures that are associated with new criticism. Now, what does new criticism talk of? What is the thing that new criticism is talking of? New criticism, criticism says that the meaning of a text, the meaning of the text should be located within the text itself. Right? So, not in what the author wants to say, not what the author intends to say, not what the history of the text is about, but only and only within the literary work and the internal relationships that work within the literary work. So, your options here are A, an emphasis on distinctive style and personality of the author, B, stressing the virtues of discipline, order and the ethical mean, right, meaning, it should be meaning here. C. Locating the meaning of a literary work in the internal relations of the language that constitute a text. D. Evaluating a literary text against a backdrop of historical events. Right? Now, what, what are the things that I said you are not included? History is not included. So, this one is excluded from the options. Distinctive style and personality of the author. What I said, it, did, it doesn't include the author. Right? Now, ethical order of meaning. This doesn't make sense. It's an option. A lot of literary jargon that is for uh, for the longest time introduced in the examination because it tends to confuse you. So, what is the correct answer? In the internal relations of language. So, when new critics uh, uh, tend to look at poems, they look at the form of the poem, the rhyme scheme of the poem, the words that are used in the poem, what is the meaning of the word that is used in the poem, how is the rhythm of the poem, right? So, all these things are focused 
while they focus on these things, what they tend to do is find out the tensions in a poem, right? Find out the points of disturbance in the poem. And a good poem, the new critic says, is the one where all these tensions are eventually resolved, right? So all the tensions in a text are finally reached, finally reach a unity. And the idea of tension was given to us by Alan Tate in his text called Tension in Poetry. Okay, right. So now moving on to the next question. In Paradise Lost, Mil Milton evokes his heavenly muse Urania at the beginning of the codes are book 1, book 4, book 9, book 7, right? Important question again, but it's not, uh, there's not much for me to explain it to you here. It's a direct question. You must look at the summary of the text. Again, John Milton, Paradise Lost, a 1667 text, eventually also went on to write Paradise Regained. Why this text gained a lot of popularity? One of the reasons why this text gained a lot of popularity is because even though Satan was the villain here, the lofty descriptions that Satan was given were astounding, right? And it's often seen as a renaissance text for that matter because the person who's revolted against the status quo, like I said in one of the previous questions, the Prometheus figure, the Satan figure, right? The one who's revolted against the power, the one who's revolted against this hierarchy to give something to mankind, to give knowledge to mankind, to give fire to mankind, right? So these are, so that's why this text gained a lot of popularity. Now this question asks you, what are the, which books is Urania, the muse, the heavenly muse, invoked in. So there is the first book that Urania, Urania is evoked in and there is book 7 in which Urania is evoked. So the, the, the options would be 1 and 4. So automatically D becomes correct, right? Book 1 also says this very popular line uh, where he says the purpose of the text is to justify the ways of God to men, right? Now I'll write it down here because it's often featured in questions. So what is the purpose with which the text is written? To justify the ways of God to men, right? This is the purpose of the text. This is also in the same first pro uh, prologue that Milton has written, right? So this is your little bit about Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost is an important text. You must look at it in detail. We're just touching upon it, right? The next question is, who among the following writers describes novel as not form which you see but emotion which you feel right now this is um, this is again a very uh, factual question but i'll tell you the name of the text so on uh, in a text called on rereading novel now as soon as i said say on rereading novels you must know who's written this text because it's an important text so this text was written by wolf virginia wolf other things of Virginia Woolf that you must look at are A, summaries, summaries of her important texts, so summaries of Dalloway, summaries of Lighthouse, right? And also the text, the non-fiction text that he's written, she's written, A Room of One's Own, where she imagines a, uh, where she imagines a fictional sister of Shakespeare, Judith, Judith and sort of um, imagines the situation that she would have been in had she written because she would never have had the opportunities that a certain Mr. Shakespeare would have, right? So it is Virginia Woolf who says, novel is not a form you see, but, with, but it's an emotion you feel. And what is the style of writing that she writes in? It's called the stream of consciousness. Where, what does she do? She, uh, in the stream of consciousness style, she tends to focus a lot on the interiority of the characters. What are the characters thinking? What are the characters feeling when they are thinking those things, right? So it's more about the interiority and that's why it's the emotion that you feel. Even if you don't know which of these writers has written this, just from this fact that you know about Virginia Woolf, it becomes pretty evident that she would be the one focusing on emotion the most, considering the kind of books that the other three authors have written, right? All three are important writers. Jean Rhee. Jean Rhee wrote um, like a spin-off of uh, your Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, which is called The White. It's called The White. 
सार्गासो सी ठीक है मूविंग ऑन द लास्ट क्वेश्चन विच अमंग द फॉलोइंग नॉवेल्स ऑफ अनिता देसाई इज अ चिल्ड्रंस बुक राइट नाउ Village, the village by us by the sea is a children's book. It's also a question that's come, and it was it was a very important and a very popular book that she's written. She was also given the Guardian Children's Fiction Prize for it. Right? It's a nineteen eighty two text written by Anita Desai. Why I included this question because this question won a prize. So for all all books, all Nobel Prize winners are important. All books that win prizes are important. So Booker Prize, all wins that uh, that win Pulitzer Prize, all books, all these texts, all these authors become important, and all these authors are authors that you must look at them, right? So with this, we complete our twenty most important questions that could be expected if not in their this form that the form that I have discussed, but just in terms of the options like I discussed with you. Laka is important. Theories are important. New criticism is important. New criticism has been a question for the last three nets, right? So all these theories, all these questions, all these points, all these authors that we have discussed are very important. I would wish you that you have a very good day, and I hope that you clear the exam with flying colors. Thank you.